everyone. Uh, welcome to S S Sustainable Stow. We are recording this so that others who couldn't attend tonight can view it on Stow TV at a later date. I'm Tina McAndrew, the Library Director, and we're back again with um, our Sustainable Stow group and their speaker tonight. Um, please keep yourselves muted just for background noise. And if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand and we'll, we'll uh, get to you as soon as we can. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Carol to introduce the speaker. Thanks, Tina. Yeah. I'm, I'm Carol Lynn, and uh, I just want you to know that our speaker tonight is Sabine Von Mering, pres uh, professor at Brandeis University. She's a Whalen resident and a local climate activist with 350 Mass. She has recently translated a book about adopting a possibilist attitude about the climate crisis. The book... You see this? Beginning to End the Climate Crisis, A History of Our Future, was written by two young adults in Germany, Luisa Neubauer and Alexander Penning, who, along with other youth, helped convince the highest court in Germany to compel the German government to strengthen their climate legislation. In her talk this evening, Sabina will introduce the book, relate it to what young people are doing, even here in Stowe and surrounding communities, and explain how you can join ongoing efforts to preserve our planet. Sabina is a 2023 Public Voices Fellow on the Climate Crisis with the Op-Ed Project in partnership with the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. She hosted various climate-related webinars at Brandeis. In addition, you can find some of her webinars online at the Brandeis Center for European Studies page climate-related articles on WBUR and the Boston Globe and other publications, and you can read numerous op-eds op that she has written about climate change at wecanstopclimatechange.com. Thank you, Sabina, for joining us today. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carol, and um, really lovely to be here with all of you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, so um, I'm happy to engage with you all in the conversation. So feel free to, you know, stop me if there's anything that doesn't make any sense. I'm I'm going to use the title that um, I don't remember who of you was was it that actually suggested this title. It wasn't me, but I really liked it. So <laughs> um, so I decided to use it. Listening to what youth want in a future climate, um, and. I was thinking that, you know, to begin with, um, youth have astonishingly clearly articulated what they want in recent years. So it's not a big secret what youth want. Um, as you can see in the pictures here, youth are not only demanding um, action, they're demanding that we tell the truth, they're demanding green jobs for all. So the, that that is sort of the um, idea behind the uh, climate justice. And um, and they want us to panic, <laughs> as Greta said in, in Davos. But if you look here on the bottom, youth have also been clearly smart about ways to basically get what they want, not just ask for it, but fight for it. And so the the recent win um, in Montana of the Juliana versus U.S. Um, climate litigation is a sign that youth are really smartening up in, in multiple ways. Um, so for this conversation, as Carol said, we're going to be talking about this book called Beginning to End the Climate Crisis. And I'll start by saying a few words about how I came to actually translate this book. Um, so the one of the authors, Luisa Neubauer, who is here pictured with Greta Thunberg, um, met Greta um, at uh, one of the uh, conferences in, in Poland, actually, uh, early on when Greta had, you know, already started her weekly protest protests outside the parliament in Stockholm. And um, it was quite clear to Luisa that something similar had to happen. And so um, that is really 
partly how the Fridays for Future movement was born. In in Germany, people just refer it to Fridays. So if you say Fridays, the they call it the Fridays or the Fridays are doing this or that. Um, and um, but of course, that's not the only uh, youth movement. There are many youth movements uh, in the world. Um, I'm just going to focus on this one because I am German and this is what I do. Um, but it's important to understand that the uh, movement that is, you know, not that well known in the United States is really a global movement. The, the biggest numbers are in Europe in many different European countries. But as you can see, there are strike actions in Africa and Asia and all the way to, down to New Zealand and also in South America and in the United States. In fact, there was a very articulate young speaker at the march in, uh, in New York on Sunday from uh, Fridays for Future. So one of their slogans, since we're talking about listening to them, one of their slogans in German is Wir sind hier, wir sind laut, weil ihr unsere Zukunft klaut. Uh, we are here, we are loud because you're stealing our future. And they are very, um, they're very good at articulating that. Oops, no, it's not going to let me play the sound here. I guess there's some, there's some restriction, maybe because of bandwidth to that. Okay. Um, it's okay. You can imagine them shouting it. Um, and so they managed within months, really, to mobilize 4 million people around the world. In 2019, the climate strike, we mobilized several buses here in, in Boston to go downtown. And we had about 7,500 people in, in the city of Boston striking. But this was really the first time that young people, and they were as young as kindergartners and even younger, um, coming out with their school teachers and their parents and really saying it's enough. And so the, the, the tone of the um, protests was very much, you know, a young people's kind of tone. So you can see here in the in the pictures, there's a lot of um, funny um, pictures of, you know, the where is my igloo? <laughs> or I I love the earth with with um, hearts and, you know, um, what are you waiting for? There's a lot of demands articulated by young people to the grown-ups to say, come on, get with it. We, we've we known this is a problem for a long time. What are you waiting for? So um, Luisa, as she was organizing Fridays for Future in Germany, um, started to chronicle sort of the experience. And that actually then became the book. And so the book is two things. It's, it's a, or three, actually. It's, it's an explanation of the problem. It's a chronicle of the development of Fridays for Future in Germany. And it also then tells you what to do. Um, so um, the original title was From Ende der Klimakrise, so literally of the end of the climate crisis, a history or a story. The word is the same in German Geschichte about our future. And, and I was really interested in translating it because I had been giving talks about um, the good news about climate change, um, trying to mobilize people with a hopeful message and an understanding that we can actually improve the situation in so many ways that will, you know, improve pro other problems as well. Um, and then I read this book in German and I realized, well, they have kind of written the book that I would have wanted to write. And so instead of writing my own, I, I, asked them if they would be interested in me translating it. Luisa has since uh, written several other books or co-written, and this one um, she co-wrote with her grandmother. And that also is, I think, an answer to this question of, you know, how do we listen to the young people? What do they want? Um, Luisa's grandmother was really one of the most inspiring voices in her ear, 
And I had the the privilege of meeting her uh, because I, my niece and I attended the book launch of of this uh, this book against powerlessness or against the powerlessness that the two of them published. Um, and she's ninety, <laughs> so you cannot imagine how feisty she is. Um, and the two of them had a fabulous uh, conversation about how do you not give up? How do you keep keep being, you know, a thorn? <laughs> how do you just keep asking? And the grandmother was really uh, great fun to listen to. And and she, you know, she co-wrote the book, so there are some passages about her life also. Um, and it it made clear where where Louisa uh, got this uh, tenacity that that gets her to withstand also a lot of um, hate online for example so anyway um, one of the questions that I was asked before when we prepared for the session was why another book about climate there are so many books already uh, why should we translate this book? And so I wanted to give a quick overview of the book to maybe make people understand what convinced me that it was uh, worthwhile. So the book is divided into 12 chapters, and they start out by talking about the fact that for them, as opposed to previous generations, the future is dystopian. And that is is deeply troubling and and traumatizing. Um, and they also are not shy to accuse our generation, my generation, and all the post-war generations for basically not doing what needs to be done, even though we knew better and we know better. Um, but then they immediately also articulate the problem that in order to move forward, we need to know where to move to. We need... Um, a better idea of where, um, how this could be different, right? Um, and so we lack a utopia is articulated that way. And then, and then I think what was compelling to me is they break the problem down into smaller chunks. So most people, when they hear about the climate crisis, say it is so overwhelming and I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. And, you know, Basically, they go from denial to despair. And instead, Louisa and Alex um, start by, first of all, dissecting the problem and then kind of taking it apart even further. And so they start um, by saying it's not an individual crisis. It is a crisis of responsibility. It is a crisis of communication. It is a crisis oops, no, I can't see, of fossil capitalism. It is a crisis of prosperity and it is a crisis of justice. So by doing that, they're actually providing sort of on-ramps, right? They're providing many, many access points where people can start and say, okay, if it's a problem of communication, then let's figure out where we can change things. Um, and then the last three chapters, educate yourselves, try, start dreaming, get organized, are really all you know, meant to mobilize people and um, get them active. So get organized was apparently the title they had initially always thought um, would be the real title for the book. and But that didn't happen. Um, so what I thought we should do is take a closer look at, at three of the chapters um, and then uh, see what we can do with that um, for you all in Stowe and, and how that might inspire um, action in Stowe and, and other communities around here. Um, so I'm going to start with chapter four. <laughs> the crisis is not an individual crisis. And um, she, they talk about, not she, they talk about together, of course, um, the luxury of riding a bicycle. And I'm just going to read a, a short part of this. Um, we don't need a panic-stricken renunciation debate, but a debate about the good ecological life. 
where the positive climate balance is associated with pleasure and luxury, moderate consumption that is in harmony with ecological cycles and respect for human rights standards can make a critical contribution to a better future. The best example is the bicycle. Once it has been produced, although the energy balance of production can still be improved, it is designed to last a long time. It has the best energy balance in use and is beneficial to health. And it has a much underestimated effect of self-empowerment. Riding a bicycle gives you true freedom of movement. The only thing a bicycle needs, apart from a little chain grease, is the time you take to ride it. And owning more than one bicycle does not make you faster. The luxury of a good and functioning bicycle is representative of a lifestyle whose core is not blind consumption at the expense of the planet and often one's own health, but a life that consciously makes use of the most valuable resource of all, time. Um, and, and I think this is, it, this speaks to, you know, especially for us in the United States, of course, um, the problem that relates to the fossil capitalism, where we have basically designed the lives we live around fossil fuels, right? The cars that we drive um, are fossil fueled and they are they have shaped how our towns are built, how our cities are structured, how how big the streets are. And so um, we know, how to change that. And I have seen actually in many parts of Massachusetts in recent years, how this has already shifted. You see so many towns now that have bicycle paths and there's more and more places where they also separate the bicycle paths from the cars to protect bicyclists. Because, you know, where I live in Wayland, it is simply not safe, safe for me to go on a bicycle. And if you think about it, that should be easy to fix. <laughs> Someone just needs to make that a priority, right? All it takes is a few bricks and a and a line to draw draw. And so in in the Netherlands, for example, people just did that. They literally just painted bicycle paths on the streets in order to change their um, transportation system long ago of course now they're they're way ahead of us with regards to bicycles um so that's one uh, part of this of these um this chapter the other is this notion of shifting baselines um and that is also something that we've seen in in many parts of the climate um problem so here they write and now you might think that there's nothing you can do about it on the whole. That is understandable. So you withdraw away from this overwhelming crisis. You focus on your own life and accept your own powerlessness. On a large scale, this creates a powerless society, literally. The fact that not everyone sees it that way, however, makes things exciting. There is already a critical mass that says, I want to do something. A mass of people who want to be part of the answer and join the team of go-getters. More and more people consider this prospect worth striving for, and rightly so. Um, and, and I just wanna emphasize this, how much this matters. So, so when we went to the March to End Fossil Fuels in New York this weekend, um, many of the students that came on the bus had never done something like that before. And I've heard from so many of them afterwards what an empowering experience it was to be part of this march, to be part of this colorful, joyful, very mixed, uh, diverse group of people singing and chanting and and also in between talking with complete strangers you know that were just because you had to wait so long all the time so you got to talking and 
it was an incredibly moving for me to see how much it affected the students and how they felt like, oh, we can do this. And that, and also to be in a group of people where you realize I'm not the only one who feels like this, right? That's usually what start, what uh, the first experience when you get involved in the climate movement, that you, you feel so relieved that finally there are others <laughs> who are also saying this is urgent this needs this needs an answer um and it really mobilizes people and um okay another chapter that i wanted to show you is um chapter 5 which is called the crisis the climate crisis is a crisis of responsibility so in this chapter um they let me see. Um, they basically, sorry. Um, so the, Louisa starts by talking about um, the the moments of gloom and doom. There, you know the 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 question people always ask is you know how can you be optimistic vis-a-vis -vis this crisis and i was really touched that she said you i mean they talk about possibilism and the whole book is laid out that way right because it it's um, inspired by the the founder of the right livelihood award for whom uh, alexander you know alexander penning was working for the right livelihood foundation and and when they first met the two of them in in Sweden, they were looking at the winners of the so-called um, alternative Nobel Prize. And they wanted to see what they could take from these people who had, against all odds, been working towards something positive, towards something good. And so... Um, that's what brought them together initially as as authors, and and that's what inspired um, the book. And initially, it wasn't really going to be so be so much about climate; it was mainly about um, about justice. Um, but despite the possibilism, um, they're they're not afraid to also acknowledge that there are moments when it feels overwhelming. And so being truthful about that and, and being able to say, yeah, I, there are moments when I'm also really depressed about this and when I feel that we cannot uh, do enough that needs to be done in, in time, it's it's an important you know, part of, of being able to withstand the, the enormous weight of this, of this issue. Um, and so I, I chose here a, a photograph that um, Barbara Dombrowski brought with her when she came here in March. Um, this was the uh, protest in uh, the last, this January, actually, when um, people protested in Lützerath, a small uh, coal mining town in the Rhineland. And that had been occupied for years and people had been trying to prevent it from being demolished. Um, and you can see the protesters on the right. Um, I was there, I wasn't there this January. I was there last year though, and I, I saw this this landscape. It is absolutely mind-boggling, you know, the huge coal mine and and the she captures the the brutality of this machine. Um and so this January 2023, um, there was a, sort of a last attempt to protect the village from being destroyed. And um, but the authorities carried people away and and demolished the village. And so this this was incredibly frustrating for all of us who have been protesting and and you know who of course, pushed for this uh, Green Party coalition to be elected and, and also the, the state of the Rhineland Falls has has a, a North Rhine Westphalia has a has a um, Green Party coalition. Um, and yet, you know, they're 
demolishing a, a village for for expanding a coal mine in 2023 in Germany, um, which was, you know, very depressing. Um, but uh, what what you see in this um, in this chapter then is um, they they. <laughs> They use a, and this is, by the way, something I also really like about the book is they they do they did a lot of research for this book and they introduce a lot of different thinkers from different periods who have inspired them, um, and so here they they choose a um, the parable of about mourning the future inspired by by Noah from no from the Bible Noah's Ark. Um, you know, who is desperate because he wants to convince people that they need to build the ark and they're not building the ark. And so he does something that is considered absolutely taboo, which is he he puts himself into a mourning outfit and cries for the dead of tomorrow, i.e. those who will have perished in the flood. And so what I'm reading here, driven by curiosity, the people finally listen to him. They are in, they are outraged and paralyzed when hearing him sing the song of the dead. At last, Noah's message gets through to them. He succeeds in persuading his fellow men to build the ark. Thus, he saves creation. His stirring spectacle saves life on earth. End of story. Um and so this is a, a piece that was written in 1961 in the face of the threat of nuclear war. Uh, but it seems more relevant than ever today. The climate crisis is here. And in some places, the situation is marked not only symbolically, by quite, but quite literally by the danger of which Noah warned his fellow men. Floods and rising sea levels threaten not only coastal states like Bangladesh and island states like the Marshall Islands, but also, for example, the Netherlands, northern Germany, and the regions around the major rivers in the United States. Some of them are in danger of sinking into the sea if the global, globally rising average temperature is not stabilized. And of course, we're witnessing uh, that right now in, in Libya. Um, and so then the question is, how might Noah get through to his fellow human beings today? Who are the Noahs of the 21st century who will use unconventional methods to persuade others to act? Is Greta Thunberg such a figure? Um, and I, and I, I mean, in a way, the whole Fridays for Future movement, of course, aspires to be such a figure. But to me, this chapter also acknowledges the role that uh, art and literature and film and storytelling have to play in getting people more active. So when we look at what can we do and we think about, you know, local issues, we always think most towns are focused, you know, on, on solar panels and, and heat pumps and EV charging stations and uh, building, you know, homes that are efficiently f efficient, which is absolutely critical, of course, for decarbonization. But I think in order to inspire more people to become involved, we actually need to also look at the arts and music and, you know, very unorthodox ways of talking about this and finding people where they are, um, whether that's in a sports club or in a a bridge club or in a book club or whatever. So um I think it's it's um it's really important. And and finally, of course, this idea of institutionalizing responsibility, right? That we can't solve this problem if we don't accept that um that this is a systemic problem, right? And we need a systemic answer. And so um one of the things that 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 they talk about is um well why don't you elect people or implement people who are actually in charge so um i know that many of our towns have now hired sustainability managers the the governor has created a chief of climate for the first time for massachusetts in january um, and every town can think about ways in which it can be implemented so that there's someone 
who prioritizes climate at every level, right? I keep saying prioritizing is really the key because if you want to make sure that school children graduate knowing what they're going to be facing and how to deal with it, that requires that someone who's in charge, like the superintendent or the principal or the department chairs in, in the different disciplines, that they have this as a pr top priority on their list so that it doesn't get forgotten. One example, we we just had a conversation a week or two ago about a new position. Brennes is starting to starting a, an engineering major. Um, and it was very important to me that they don't create something and then say, okay, and now let's try to make sure that there are also classes that are sustainable or focus on climate. No, in order to make sure that climate is a focus, the hiring committee has to have someone on it <laughs> that is entirely focused on this issue so that the person chosen to begin with is the person is a person that that prioritizes climate right so so there are ways in which we can get at this systemic problem that have nothing to do with um necessarily decarbonization itself um, and so finally, I just wanted to quickly also go into the 11th chapter, um, because that's, you know, where the fun stuff happens. <laughs> and it begins with, um, so the, the chapter is called Start Dreaming, um, which I think is really important. I hope you're not all asleep and starting to dream, but um, I'm going to get you to do some moral stretch stretching exercises. So this is what they say. So stretch your imagination and your emotions. Following the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, the philosopher Günther Anders identified a fundamental discrepancy between imagination and invention. Human achievements, inventions, had increased and reached a point of such complexity that one was no longer able to imagine the consequences of the technologies and to comprehend them emotionally. This was obviously written before Oppenheimer. Now we can all, we all know more. Unless all is to be lost, Anders concludes, the decisive moral task today is the formation of moral imagination, i.e. the attempt to overcome the gap, to measure the capacity and elasticity of our imagining and feeling against the dimensions of our own products and the foreseeable extent of the damage we can do. According to Anders, the means to overcome this gap are moral stretching exercises. Similar to the stretching exercises in sports, which are supposed to increase physical flexibility and resilience, it is necessary to train one's own imagination and emotions by stretching. How is this to be done? For one thing, by starting to think in large dimensions. This must be practiced. The climate crisis created by the global aggregate of greenhouse gas emissions is admittedly too large for us to imagine its entirety. But through practice, we can improve our cognitive ability to visualize the consequences of our actions for the world's climate. On the other hand, we can let ourselves be touched by the disasters that the climate crisis is already causing today. In the parable of the lamented future that we told in chapter five, Noah manages to convince his compatriots of the impending flood by weeping for future generations. Had the people ignored his tears, the ark would never have been built. If we are emotionally stunted because we do not realize what we are doing with our consumption habits, our energy production or our production methods, the moral appeals of our contemporary profits will die away without any effect. Both capacities, imagination and emotional sensitivity are important not only for understanding our present, but also for the images we form of the future, the positive and the negative. And then they go on and tell us how to um, 
really force ourselves to imid- imagine what can happen. And of course, this summer, we've all kind of seen what the future may look like, and it's quite, it's quite um, disturbing. So that is, you know, fuel, <laughs> solar generated fuel um, for the imagination. And that requires us to be, um, to think utopian. Um, I use a picture here from futur2.org, which is a website that a colleague um, Harald Welzer has created in Germany, um, which is exactly this idea, future future two. So this is, you know, past, future past. And it is a, um, a website with ideas of what the future could look like that would be um, a climate-friendly p- future. Um, and so you can see here the pi- the picture of beets, and it says "geputzt werden muss immer," which literally means you always have to clean. Um, and that is um, actually an uh, advertisement for a, um, um, a cleaning liquid that is made from red beets. <laughs> so it's very sustainable cleaning liquid. Um, so I mentioned the march on Sunday. Here's my group uh, that traveled together and me with my costume of course um, who had a fantastic time and this was um, you know as I said a march with a smile with a lot of kids and a lot of um, very creative um, signs and of course we were also there from 350 mass so I thought I should I should show that so we were in, this was not the whole group, but this was taken at the very end. Um, and so I think that definitely going to such events is a good start to to um, get people excited and engaged. And so now for the last five minutes, I'm just going to go over a few ideas of what we can take from this. And then I'm hoping we can all have that conversation together. Um, for the remainder of the time. So what can we learn from the from the Fridays for Future movement um, for local efforts in store or elsewhere? Um, so obviously the first um, <laughs> the first thing to do is get together. Um, I always hear from people that they're really frustrated when when not people sh- when not many people show up. Um, I was just talking to a group of students about that yesterday. You don't need that many people. You know, you all know the Margaret Mead quote that you don't need that many people to change the world. Nothing has ever been done (laughs) if it wasn't for a few people. The truth is, if you have five to eight people, that's really the best number, or maybe 10 or 12. You don't need more people to make change happen. But you have to meet, you have to meet, you have to start, you have to start talking. And the talking is a really important part. Um, One can start by reading books together, watching movies together. That was something that we did a lot at the beginning in in 350 Mass. We did a lot of movie screenings to get people involved. Um, You know, uh, Yale Climate Communications has... A, a lot of data on its website and and the and they have these maps of the United States showing what people are doing or saying about climate or thinking about climate. And the one thing that always gets to me is how few people talk about climate. There are many parts of the country where people basically never talk about it. And of course, if you don't talk about it, nothing will be done. Um, locally, um, we're working in Wayland now to get the schools involved. We've been with Energize Wayland. We've been meeting with all the principals to see what are kids actually learning about climate change. The reality is precious little. And I was shocked to hear in my webinar with the German climate scientists today that the same is true for Germany. Kids are actually not learning much about the climate crisis and especially even, you know, they might learn something about the carbon cycle, but they do not talk about what to do. They do not talk about how to build resilience. They do not talk about how to deal with climate catastrophes, which they are going to be facing, you know. 
So I think getting climate literacy requirements into all our schools, New Jersey has done it. They, they were the first. They just finished their first year. Connecticut, I think, is following suit. Oregon tried but failed. But that's almost it. Like There's hardly any state um, that requires climate literacy. And, and when you go to the New, Jer New Jersey um, website, you can see that the schools have excellent um, a, a curricula for from kindergarten through through I mean all through K twelve um, with age appropriate materials and and required um, knowledge. So don't wait until you have a mass movement. Just do stuff. Just doing stuff is you know. Um, Rob Hopkins from the Transition Town Movement has written a beautiful book about that. Just doing stuff or just do stuff. Um, just start. Just start somewhere. Guerrilla gardening is one of my favorite ideas. That we should just start growing food on the islands <laughs> that are, you know, just ignored in our or fruit or flowers, something fun in our towns, and paint paint bicycle paths. Um, connecting across differences, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, the climate justice issue is so important for the young people. And I think we need to be much better at that, meeting people where they're at, forming alliances across differences with any kinds of groups. There are so many people who are concerned and they just want to be asked. We just need to ask them. Hold each other accountable for pushing for systemic change. We you know, we often make plans and there's lots of committees and plans and reports and stuff and then nothing happens. So building in, like in, in Wayland, we had a climate emergency declaration past town meeting and our committee that created that was very smart in ensuring that that passing that declaration was all automatically tie, tied with now we're going to hire a uh, sustainability manager. Now we're going to create a climate action mobilization plan. Like these things were tied in so that stuff actually happened. And then the accountability can, can be built in. That's really critical. Um, don't think of it as a technical problem. Think of, of it as a problem of the imagination. I think that's always a way to get also creative people involved. Anyone can help. Give yourself a break. <laughs> I was listening to you all in Stowe about how much you've already achieved. I'm really impressed. Such a small group of people. Um, and you should really be proud of yourselves. And yes, write, write good, good books and take a break. And yes, register people to vote <laughs> also. Okay, I think that's all I got. So questions. Oh, you're on mute, Carol. It's not the raise their hand. Um, do you see differences between youth involvement in the U.S. compared with the youth involvement in Germany or or Europe? Oh yeah, absolutely, and it has to do with money. Mm. It's very simple. Um, in the United States, you pay. What is it now? Seventy thousand dollars a year for tuition, or you know whatever you end up paying. But in Germany, you don't pay hardly anything, and so when when kids go to school, they don't have to worry that going to university will require an enormous financial burden of them. And and yes, some people definitely worry about financing their studies but it's nothing compared to what's going on here so um i think going on a school strike <laughs> is is much more likely to happen in in that case whereas here mm -hmm. there's a lot of pressure on kids you know to get good grades so that they can get scholarships so that they can go to a school that is acceptable to their parents mm -hmm. That's one argument. I mean, there are many other arguments, but um, I think there's also, I mean, 
you know, I get all these emails from my German friends. Oh, yeah. And then I'm going to be on my three week holiday for the <laughs> for the year, you know, and I know so many people in America that don't even have three weeks ever. And, you know, this is only one of their vacations in Germany. So people are just better at balancing life and work. And there's more attention paid on on the good life, so to speak. And that that's in danger is also more, more, I think, feared. Whereas here, everyone is just always working, working, working and not really paying attention. Interesting. Um, but that shouldn't say that young people are not engaged. I mean, young people here are definitely also mad. And we have the Sunrise Movement and we have, you know, organizations that are, there is some Fridays for Future. There is the Climate Strikes, you, the Youth Alliance also here in Massachusetts. Um but it's a lot harder for kids here, I think. Um, do you have any insights on what our local college students are doing regarding climate? Well, I met with five of them yesterday here. Um, and as a, as you saw, I took about 50 or 40 of them to, to New York. Um, at Harvard, they are pressing the university to stop taking funds from fossil fuel companies for research. Um, there is still a divestment movement that is still operating. We just had a win. I forgot where. Um, you know, but they're demanding um, accountability. They're looking. They're they're looking very carefully at how they can make a difference. Uh, climate justice is an important piece for them. They understand that this problem is going to be affecting some much worse than others. And so, um, you know, an intersectional approach is really important to them. And some are also reaching out across, like from college to college, working together. Um but that said, my colleague who teaches climate science also says that that this idea of climate anxiety or climate depression is spreading fast, which is really interesting. When I taught my climate change course for the first time 12 years ago, students literally walked in and said, what is climate change? Like, can you explain? I don't understand. And I will never forget one student saying, yeah, I, I imagine that it's going to affect us like in 400 years. That was 12 years ago. And now they walk in and they're all saying, I'm overwhelmed. It's we're not going to stop it. It's too late. You know, we're screwed. Um, and so I think there is that it has to do also with the media, the way this is presented in the media as a, you know, I mean, I, I actually, <laughs> I wrote an op-ed about this. I counted the articles that the New York Times published about climate change for like a number of months. And there was practically nothing about activism, about the the things ordinary people can do. It was all wildfires, floods, droughts, chaos. Um, I mean, no wonder people think that they can't do anything when there's not much attention paid on the many people who are doing so much, you know. Yeah, that's my my kids are both that well, my son especially, very um depressed about climate change. Mm -hmm. You know, not not thinking we're gonna make a difference. Yeah. Um what are your thoughts about reaching out to like middle and elementary school students so they can learn about preventing you know, further climate change. And I know it's kind of it's different than the high schoolers, right? Because you don't want to scare them overly. But um, have you had any any yeah. thoughts or dealings with that? Yeah, I actually did a program at Whalen Library uh, this summer for second graders. And there are wonderful picture books um, uh, about climate change for the little ones. I can I, I'm now I'm here and not at home, so I don't have them here. But um, but um, 
beautiful books that <laughs> I, I, I chose three books and I called it Stronger Together. And I focused on books that highlighted um, how people gathered and collectively tried to change something. And so there were always pictures of demonstrations. And I would ask the kids, so what is this? What's going on here? And they would say, oh, that's a parade or that looks like a festival. And and I'm like, yep, that's a demonstration. And then we got to the next book and I said, look, what's this? And they, oh, another parade. <laughs> and you know, and why not? I mean, if we can make it look like a parade or a festival, as long as they understand that this is something one can do. Um, so I think that's why I really like the New Jersey curriculum. If it's done in age appropriate ways, I think the earlier you get kids to understand what is going on, um, the more likely are you going to have the the future Elon Musk or whatever? You know, Elon Musk is not my my friend anymore. <laughs> um, but people who come up with phenomenal solutions, um, how are they going to come up with that if you don't even tell them what's going on? And most students in Massachusetts learn about the climate crisis in eighth grade for a few weeks. That's it in science class. Um, and that's not enough. The the other classes that, at least in Wayland, we found that do cover it are interestingly the foreign language classes, because foreign language teachers have more flexibility as to what they cover, as long as they cover vocabulary. So um, many students mentioned that, yes, in foreign language, they actually talk about climate. Um, so there there's a lot of room for improvement. The question um, I had is um, sort of back into what you were saying in terms of, um, you know, there's some real movement in in our country about uh, what you teach kids mm -hmm. um, because it, it makes them feel bad. Mm -hmm. So the crisis of climate is such that not exposing them to it um, seems like a disservice. Of course, there's many th topics that are not being disposed. But at the same time, you the anxiety that is being recorded as uh, specifically in teenagers and stuff, um, the mental anguish um, that they're feeling. Um, mm -hmm. How is that balanced? And certainly, Clearly, in this book, the you have two young people who, uh, and Greta Thun Thunberg overcame. I mean, she before she did the her Fridays, she was terribly sick. She stopped eating. She was terribly depressed. Um, that is, and it ties also in with that chapter on communication. How do you communicate to be impactful yet? not blow people out and special kids yeah i i think um that's why i really like the last three chapters of the book that focus on empowerment right this is about empowerment students need to feel that you're giving them something to do i i wrote about this in in the one piece about education that you know when i gave a talk at wellesley high school one of the kids said afterwards well, if what you say is true, why aren't they telling us? And it it made me cry. I was literally crying on the way home because I felt like <clears throat> he's right. Like that is just so unfair that he feels that th that he doesn't actually have the basic knowledge that he needs in order to prepare for what's coming. And so I think this fear of making kids depressed with the facts is actually much less important than not telling them the truth. I think we need to tell them the truth and I think we need to empower them and we need to give them the tools so that they can be prepared, so that they know what's coming, so that they can um, also, for example, choose to focus on this, right? I mean, 
I'm always surprised how few people actually say they're going to make this uh, their career. Um, in a way, we're we're looking at. I mean, I I was a little bit disturbed today in the conversation with the climate scientists when he was saying that the professor that you know we're talking about up to three to six degrees of warming this century, but over land, it can mean 10 degrees. I had not heard that before because I'm not a climate scientist, right? So these are always averages that they're talking about, right? So it can be truly disastrous. And so I think it is absolutely a disservice to think, well, we, we can't tell our kids because they're going to be depressed. No, we need to really, really make sure the kids know the, know the facts and they know what to do because then they will also make the demands that need to be made. We're still expanding fossil fuel infrastructure. Even the International Energy Agency tells us that's a mistake. Here in Massachusetts with a governor who claims to be a climate um, champion, right? We are expanding the very thing that kills us. <laughs> that makes no sense. And, and, you know, the kids that are now in school, they're going to hold all of us accountable. And so I think, um, yeah, avoiding the subject is, is not the answer. It needs to be done in a smart way. It needs to be done in a creative way. I, I loved how the students said that it made them feel so good to be able to be in this march and shout and see that other people were there so many different types of people different ages different you know ethnicities and so on and to understand that they were not alone with their fears mm -hmm. Sabrina. um first of all thank you sabina i have the book right here it's it's fantastic um the, the 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 terms um anxiety anxiousness um uh, depression have just uh, been mentioned by by Sharon and by Carol um and I think there is that that's a big deal because yeah. anxiety um leads to shutting down and and to say I don't want to have anything to do with this so I buy my next lollipop and will be happy and leave everything else to to go to hell um so so uh you said Sabina telling the truth yeah that's that's a responsibility that our generation has and everyone else has but I think to give tools for doing something as you mentioned is really crucial because that gives a sense of control I can do something I'm not only passively victim of whatever doom is going to come my way and then there's this big tidal wave and there's nothing uh, uh, that ca anyone can do mm -hmm. um so so if we want to avoid denial which uh, and and that comes through anxiety we have mm -hmm. to offer the, the the positive um track to to control yeah and i think that's why i love so much that this book is on possibilities it's there is a positive twist to it it's not just doom and gloom and oh god how terrible everything is and it is terrible mm -hmm. but if we have the 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 the, the projects even in kindergarten i mean what can i do today to save mm -hmm. the world isn't that exciting yeah you know that kind of Thing. We can do that at kindergarten level, we can do that at, uh, at uh, uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, college, uh, mm -hmm. uh, post-grad levels and mm -hmm. citizen uh, level. So, so I think that positive element is really more, um, more effective than, mm -hmm. than crisis and doom and gloom, which, which is there, yes. Mm -hmm. But we have to overcome it or try to overcome it. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm no, not... that's fine. I yeah. think it's great points. Um, I just want to do a follow-up question, if I may. Um, so you mentioned um, certainly about kids telling the truth and stuff. 
how do you reach the parents to overcome their anxiety or their biases um, about what they want to do to protect their kids? Yeah, that's a good point. I actually brought my my flag here. This is from the town I the city I was born in, um, and they have um, <laughs> this is. Um, from the parents for future. So in Germany, everyone is now in for future. There's scientists for future. There's psychologists for future. There's there's um, students for future. And there's also an organized uh, group of parents for future. Um, and I know that um, Harriet Sugarman, who wrote a, an endorsement for our book. She has something similar, and we have Mothers Out Front, of course, and other organizations. So I think it's very important that parents also join forces and don't sit there by themselves thinking, oh my God, how do I tell my child? But actually, you know, share uh, with others their fearing, feelings and their fears and their um, also their success stories. Um, so that's a big part. Um, I think um, we just had a, a case in sort of the more activist group where a woman in uh, at line three who was arrested, um, you know, she's facing prison time now because she didn't accept a plea deal. And she was saying, I was brought into the climate movement through my child, through my daughter, because my daughter came in. I didn't want her to be facing this alone. And so she joined her. And I think oftentimes parents are brought in through their children. For example, when it comes to diet, right, to to reduce meat consumption, that's often how the kids start changing their parents. And um, so I think... Um, it would be great also, for example, for a town to offer parent evenings at school about this. How do I talk to my kids about climate change? That could be a great evening program. Um, and there's, I'm sure there's books about it. I think I've seen a book about it. <laughs> um, and um, yeah. I, I, I emphasize the talking so much um, because we don't talk about it. That's what the studies show again and again. People do not talk about it. And the, all the anxiety and fear, of course, is it gets worse when people just stuff themselves with the bad news and don't let it out and <laughs> You know, and I think that's also why the students had such a good experience this Sunday, because they were together. And the pandemic has made this much worse. Isolation, I think there was a piece in the New York Times about it. Isolation and loneliness are a huge problem. A third of Americans live alone, and many of them are elderly, and many of them are, you know, are not talking to anyone. Mm -hmm. so. Um, yeah, the one thing I wanted to mention um, was that uh, we just received um, a s notice from Sunrise Movement that they um, are real excited about the announcement of the uh, Climate Corps. Yes. Uh, it's and um, they acknowledge the fact that they have been working hard for a while and these things take time. Yeah. And unfortunately, we don't have time. And so um, there, there, there's that tension and balance between how you push things to get it to happen. And yeah. yet it takes a while. Yeah. Yeah. This thing about time is interesting. Um, you know, we can't go from we don't really think this is a problem to, oh, it's too late. That's, in my eyes, just another form of denial, right? The fact of the matter is life will go on and we better get our act together. And yes, there is a, uh, there is going to be, there are going to be some things that we may not be able to stop, but to, to feel this, this time pressure, I don't think is very helpful. 
I think it's more important that people get involved and that good stuff happens and that we make sure people have examples to follow and models to emulate and um and don't you know I mean yes there I think Naomi Klein was was shown with the clock <laughs> that clicks ticks down to to when with the 1.5 degrees are no longer reachable but as Michael Mann and others have shown if we do start to decarbonize big time then we do reverse um, the impact so we can, and, and the scientists just confirmed this again today, technically, scientifically, we can still reach the 1.5 degrees toll, uh, target. It is a sim it's simply a political issue now. And so people who care and people who understand and are concerned just need to stop not talking about it. They need to start talking about it. They need to start making demands. They need to start doing stuff. Mm -hmm. that's what I would say um, I wanted to bring up one thing from the chat um, which I've seen is when we talked about children's books mm -hmm. uh, she wanted to um, Maggie asked if can you get a list of children's books in a follow up yes. um, someone had uh, the water protectors and she has that one um, but would be really interested in having others that would be appropriate for kids Yes, and I, um, of course, I'm blanking now on the names. I had these wonderful. Um, Sabine, if you want, you could yeah, make up the list, you know, later, give me the I'll list. I'll make the I'll, list. I'll send it to yes. the library and to, to other people. I think one is called Speak Up or Speak Out, and one is called Save Our Earth, but I'm I'm not 100% sure. that I used three for that one program, and... Um, but there are plenty of others. And, you know, this is something I love about this country, the picture books. I mean, America has phenomenal picture books and the people who have made climate picture books are awesome. Okay. So, I'll send that to you. Sabina, has Wayland done the Cooler Climate Fair? Have you heard about that? The Cooler um, Communities Climate Fair? I know that. I know that we're talking about it. I think they have done it maybe a couple of times in some places, but there actually was just some conversation about doing it again. Um, I've been also in touch with Uli um, from climate, from cooler communities. Um, right. Um, yeah, I mean, those are the kinds of things. The, the reason I emphasize climate literacy is that I'm really interested in systemic change and these fairs are nice, but they're one-offs, right? So you don't um, want to only do something that happens once and then it's gone. It's, it's I think having a, a curricular reform that includes climate at different stages again and again with more advanced and, and you know, elaborate information i think that's key um because otherwise when you do things that are dependent on someone organizing something if that someone isn't there to organize it then it doesn't happen like it needs to ideally it should be a mandate like in new jersey um until that happens in massachusetts you know schools should do they what they can to I mean, I know you said you're already working on that right yeah well there there are I I've done a lot of talk speaking with Uli and she gave me a bunch of people to talk to about this and and there are a bunch of towns who've done it multiple years in a row they're like doing it every other year yeah uh, but at Neshoba our our school district they're starting to they're working on how to incorporate climate the, the issues about climate through the entire curriculum so not mm -hmm. just having a climate class but mm -hmm. everything have exactly. it in everything yeah. and so we're figuring out trying to figure out how do we now tie the fair with what they're learning mm -hmm. learning in school and, yeah and uh, i haven't been to one so i don't know exactly mm -hmm. how that would work but i'm sure they they would be when i ask um friends of mine in Concord, what was the biggest thing to get their, their people 
um, engaging about mm-hmm. climate change. They said the biggest positive thing was the climate fair because it got mm-hmm. when you have a fair with kids, all the adults get involved. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they said all of a sudden they had a surge of people in Concord who wanted to do stuff for climate. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really awesome. So we're looking at that. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. If there's no more questions. Sabina, <laughs> I want to thank you. Thank you for uh, um, doing this. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Time. This was a lot of good information, a lot to digest. Thank you. Yes. Um, and uh, I noticed that there's some some listeners that we don't usually have. So I just wanted to to let you all know that yeah, um, you can join Sustainable Stow. <laughs> we meet each month on the fourth Thursday uh, on Zoom, and you can also check out what we're doing on Facebook with Sustainable Stow, and we have all of the library uh, recordings that we've done every month for the past, what, two and a half years now, um, out on Stow TV on YouTube. Yes. I I just um, wanted to ask a question. I don't know if you collaborate with other organizations in town. Because I know um, this morning I attended a webinar through NASJA. Yes. And it was on indigenous knowledge and um, using the s- same topic. But um, in D- it's it's a five-part series. And this was the first part was today. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I don't have it in front of me and but I so I can't remember all the topics, but there are different Massachusetts um, indigenous presenters each for each session. And so it's um, it it was it was really good. And um, it is specifically geared towards um, using the indigenous knowledge of Massachusetts based. people and incorporating that into um climate action so yes. so it just is interesting that this is being offered i live in maynard but mm-hmm. uh, you know i um do a lot of things with different organizations around and um and so yeah so the one one stow group was doing a, a climate um series starting today this morning and then here you are tonight so <laughs> yay sto <Yeah. laughs> that's great thank you uh, yay for maynard because uh we certainly know uh green maynard has done some uh, fabulous stuff and you've gotten some things done like uh, banning plastics and uh, some other things so uh, we try no you do you really do and uh, yeah. we know orion uh, and you've got she's awesome. Oh my gosh, she's a force. <laughs> and you got my colleague Sally Warner now, who is a climate scientist who lives in Wayne. I think she's involved as well. With oh yeah, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we have we have some brilliant women in Maynard. I've got to say, <laughs> um, who and and it's always the women. Sorry, Richard. <laughs> but but women are the change makers, you know, and that's just. And you know what's interesting? Women are also more resilient often, right? There's a lot of examples for women under extreme conditions just being more resilient. By the way, the woman that you see behind me here is Sophie Buxton. And she was uh, together, she together with Louisa was involved in the lawsuit that Carol mentioned at the very beginning where they sued the German government. She lives on an island in the North Sea and I grew up on an island in the North Sea. And that's why Barbara Dombrowski took this right. photograph of her. Oh, in, wow. In and um, and they won the lawsuit and forced uh, the Mecca government to increase its you know to up its uh, climate targets but now we have a different situation with the war going on and stuff so yeah we'll see 
Yeah, every time and I see that. And it's all that, connected. Yeah. yeah. yeah every time I and see we are all connected. And, you know, it, it's this whole individualism that is killing all of us. Greed and individualism. Mm. We're in it together. And yes. we're making it better. What did you want to say, Carol? Oh, every time I see, you know, film about the wars on Ukraine, you know, on in the news and stuff, all I keep thinking, my first thought is, oh, my God, look at all those emissions going up into the sky. You know, you just see these guns and then smoke just, you know, and I'm just like, oh, no, and fires, you know, buildings. And I'm like, this is awful. I mean, it's awful what Russia is doing to Ukraine and to the people. But has anyone thought, what is this doing to our climate? Right. It just every yeah. time I see these, I I just yeah. Like, oh, the no. young the young person from Ukraine that I hosted this summer calls it a climate war. Hmm. Yeah, because it it was fossil fueled from the beginning, of course, and it's still, you know, the whole gas issue, right, is still central to it, right, yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thank you again. And thank, you. Uh, thank everybody for attending. And again, it will be uh, recorded. And so tell your friends and uh, we'll be sending out links to the recording. So um, thank you, Tina, for hosting. And uh, awesome. thank you, everybody. <laughs> next, next week, just to next month, uh, just to let you know, uh, we will have Doug Tallamy uh speaking um about um uh, alien plants and what to uh what it does to uh biodiversity and issues of that nature so uh look forward to uh look out for the uh, publication of that that's great thank so you and Sabina, also feel free anytime, you know, you if you are interested in these, you can pass it on to 350 Mass or anyone you know. Do. Yeah. No, the, the native plants issue is a big issue. And as someone who is rewilding, I am struggling with some invasive stuff. <laughs> yes. We know that. <laughs> yeah, we're all living that. <laughs> All right. Well, good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.